We're trying to track down a male porn star from the 90s who just got <laughs> released from jail. And um, basically, like, some bloods that we know attacked him with eggs on the street. And there was a viral video of it. And we're trying to get in touch with him. But apparently, he's, like, too much of a street walker at this point to have, like, social media or anything. I don't know. Wow. It's a whole thing. But we also suspect that he might have been forbidden from creating an OnlyFans or social media profiles by the judge because we, we had somebody, I don't know if we believe it, but who told us that he has 10 rape charges. Can, and do judges forbid people from making OnlyFans? Is there precedent for this? Maybe on parole or probation. Right? Like while you're on parole, maybe they could forbid you from doing it. Just because I don't see any reason why he wouldn't have started uh, OnlyFans. Considering he seems kind of hard up for money. My other theory is that he has AIDS. I don't know. And that would prevent you from starting an only. I guess I don't know much about male OnlyFans performers. Oh, we should start there. Let's start there. Are we recording? Yeah. Okay. You don't. Well, <laughs> we exist. Oh, you're all on OnlyFans? Oh, I'm on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. How much money do you make? I shall not answer that. Top point zero one percent. Top point zero. Okay. Yeah. I have like a graph that shows what that is equivalent to. So. Really? Yeah. Oh, you've or done is that, that work. Kind of outdated though. We've talked about that, but never knew that anybody actually did the science. Yeah, I did a survey of a bunch of OnlyFans girls and what what incomes corresponds to what. But again, this is outdated, and so as like incomes rise, then the percentage changes. Can we talk about the inequality in the adult industry where the guys like clearly has the harder job? but gets paid way less. <laughs> I really feel like we need to speak out for yeah. all the men out there. Yeah, where's the gender equality? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay, so you can get behind that. <laughs> well, I mean, It's not the hill I want to die on, but it is a hill I want to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, well, to be fair, ultimately, I like the free market. And clearly, people are valuing male and female labor differently in the sex industry. It's true. It's not about how hard the job is, unfortunately. Yeah, it's about how hard the dick is. And the scarcity, mm -hmm. you know, it's... Although, I just did a study on... So, I, I had somebody scrape the data from an escort listings website. Okay. So, I have, you know, a bunch of data about, like, wh wh what people describe themselves as, what their physical attributes are, their gender. And I was shocked to find that the male escorts don't charge that much less than the female ones. Hmm. Like, a high-end male escort charges around as much as, like an average female escort. And to be fair, there might be selection bias, like maybe the guys who don't who aren't like super jacked and willing to like get hard no matter what. Maybe mm -hmm. they're not listing themselves as escorts, but I think it's partially like a scarcity issue where there are a lot of attractive women who are willing to have sex for money and with men I feel like it's just not really like a coveted position. Like a, lo a lot of the dudes who do this, they they hide it. They don't want, they don't want you to know. Wait, about I that. feel like it's way higher status for a man to be like, hey, I get paid to have sex. People pay me to have sex with them. I think deep down, all men kind of look at other male sex workers as kind of bitch made. And I might be saying that because I have a little bit of a selection bias towards uh, the hip hop community and the black community in which like, I see the way it is for the porn star dudes. And it's like, they get respect because they're making a good amount of money. They're and all these girls so it's like there's an amount of admiration they get from their community for that but then it's also looked at as a little taboo and a little weird but that yeah. that's porn star stripper i mean those guys are making a shitload of money they're tons of girls ain't no cool black dudes out here bragging about being a stripper even though some of them do do it but it's they don't they don't want to put it on front street I, normally, all the podcasts I'm on are typically really tech heavy, like Silicon Valley, whatever. And I don't think I've ever talked to somebody who feels like they might know more about the sex industry than I do in some areas. Well, we're here. Yeah. Because cool. I was watching you with the dudes, uh, the trigonometry dudes oh, or yeah. whatever. And that was funny because <laughs> yeah. it's like there's so much shit that they had to like grill you on that I was just like, oh my God, are you fucking serious? Like when you're saying, like, I, I feel like I would feel more dehumanized working in a factory than being a sex worker and to them that's like mind-blowing and i'm like of course of course wait so do you have run-ins with like conservative crowds like when you post your uh, oh, shit yeah. online do you like the right conservative people get horrified at you and well i'm gonna be real with you i feel like my time doing porn never got any blowback from the conservative community and then i let my wife get by one oh, African American yeah. oh. man, and boom, I'm like the enemy of the conservatives, <laughs> even though I feel like I'm pretty, you know, center 
politically. Now, I am certainly center-left. I am a Kamala voter, or I shall be. Uh, but, I mean, it's it was kind of crazy to see that just happen instantaneously. Even though I already had, like, existing relationships with a lot of, you know, the, the whatever pod and the and fresh and fit and even like i get on on stream with aiden ross and andrew tate as a result of that whole situation and andrew Wait, tate, so this was a situation your wife or black guy was so we've been doing porn thing. for a while oh, yeah we get married and like two months later we uh, totally unrelated to the marriage part she does her first ever scene with another guy uh, who yeah. just so happened to be a gigantic black man and then you become a cook, obviously this began a very interesting uh, career arc for me, in which I was <laughs> treated like a really, truly sick individual. Dude, yeah. people can't handle Dudes especially cannot handle the concept that you could be okay with like somebody that you love having sex with somebody else. I think it's like a typical mind fallacy thing. Like, like people are pretty good at being like, okay, so I'm straight, you're gay. I can't imagine how you would like having sex with men, but right. like I, I'm gonna like kind of try and imagine it, and then mm. they do it enough, and then we seem to be fine with gay people now. But this is not extended whatsoever to uh, open relationships in this sense, right? Yeah. Although I would say that like the vast majority of the people who are shitting on me for the whole cuck thing probably are the same crowd that would be angered by you know somebody choosing to be in a gay relationship or whatever. Oh yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, it was like primarily coming from the right. Up. When I would see like larger uh, left leaning publications or um, commentators, YouTubers talk about it, it would usually be like a very brief conversation. Like somebody like Destiny talks about it and it's like a fucking 30 second yeah, conversation yeah. where it's like, yeah, I mean, if you want, if it makes them happy, sure. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. He's way more tolerant about stuff like that. He's a freakazoid, <laughs> zestophile. <laughs> A I don't know. Zestophile? Uh, zestophile. I, I, I don't actually mean that because that's just something somebody called me on here one time that just really stuck in my what does brain. does it mean like you're spicy? In hip hop. Because he's very spicy. Zesty has become like a pretty popular stand in for like n gay or gay ah. presenting ish. Okay, I just assumed it was. What, where am I, by the way? So I feel like I entered a different world here. <laughs> like, okay, so for one. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, I feel like it's actually slightly intimidating because normally I have like this kind of weird thing to pull out of my hat, which is like, oh, I have sex. And everybody goes like, you know, gasps and clutches things. Okay. Uh, and I'm like very chill about so it. So you don't know anything about me? Uh, well, I watched some of your interviews, but I didn't get the fact that you did porn from that. Okay. Yeah. I, I come from the BMX world. I rode BMX bikes for 10 years. Then I ran this really big BMX website and uh, YouTube channel and shit for like 10 years. Then at some point I start interviewing BMX riders. I switch over into interviewing rappers and shit mm -hmm. and like a lot of porn stars and stuff too then 2016 i get into a relationship with this girl lena who like very soon after i get into a relationship with her she ends up becoming one of the biggest only fans girls hey. and then she kind of like uh, gets more into the porn side of things with me. We start a podcast called Plug Talk, available only plugtalk.com, which uh, we interview a different girl every week and then have sex with her on camera. Oh, that's great. Right. Oh, that warms my heart. We, we invented this concept. <laughs> that's lovely. Does it do well? Uh, yeah. Nice. Can't complain. Okay. I don't even have my own personal OnlyFans. I do everything through the Plug Talk thing. That's fantastic. But um, yeah, that's my whole deal. And okay. now at this point, we're like three years in, so I guess we've shot like 150 scenes on Plug Talk, and then however many other shit for OnlyFans and all that kind of stuff. That's great. That's all right. Okay, so what in in your culture? Let's say BMX rappers and shooting porn on camera. What makes somebody really valuable? Like, if you were gonna be hanging out with people and then signal that you're like a really cool person, what's the kind of thing you could say where people would quietly be like, "Damn, that's awesome." I mean, BMX and rappers, like very different they are. cultural values, <laughs> Dude, for I'm sure. Like, I'm, like, I'm like from the internet. I grew right. up on like internet dirt holes. Right. And so this is like, uh, I've like barely listened to any rap and I know that BMX has something to do with bikes. Like this is how far away from this thing I am. I mean, the capacity for violence would be like a huge thing there. Really? In, in all my years in BMX, like fighting, was just not really that much of a thing. Like dudes would get into like a drunken bar fight here and there, but not a big thing. Whereas like hip hop is this like crazy fucking honor culture where like, 
you know, th there will be dudes who like are widely suspected of having killed someone, and and they get like a shitload of respect, and people talk about them as if they're like a very high value person. Uh, which is obviously something that doesn't really exist in most parts of our culture. Yeah, it's really culture. unusual. Yeah. Are you good at fighting? Nah. Okay. No. Do you think you would be if you had to? I think I'm probably. I think I could beat up a lot of people, but I don't really. Could you beat up everybody in this room? But okay, that that's. <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> Burly Hurley, hell no. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Like, okay, that, that's a weird thing though. Is like a bunch of people have like challenged me to duels mm -hmm. throughout my time in hip hop, and I I always no, I'm not doing it. Like, I'm just not gonna go meet up with you in a parking lot and fight you to like figure out who's the toughest. Which I think has probably been like a very good decision overall. Yeah. Because once you do it one time, you kind of have to do it over and over and over you every time. You have to do it over and over again. Well, you just seem kind of like hypocritical if you did it for one guy, and then maybe some big ass dude wants to square up in the parking see, lot, and I you see. say no, because like then you start to get into like a prison attitude, which is basically you have to fight everybody yeah. who disrespects you in the in the slightest bit. I hadn't thought that through. Yeah. I probably would naively have would, would have accepted a duel if challenged, and then you know been in over my head. I mean, that's kind of the thing about the whole gangbanger thing is that you basically have to accept every challenge. You Wait, what you is a gangbanger thing besides sex? I would say like <laughs> most gang mem gangs are basically like neighborhoods or organizations that. Well, I understand that, what gangs are, but what a gangbanger? A dude who is in a gang. Okay. Okay. I see. I was homeschooled. I grew up in Idaho. Right. I don't. <laughs> this is like. So yeah, maybe we should talk about you and not just gangs. <laughs> 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 okay, Idaho. Yeah. That's where you don't want to be in the uh, Ebonics Miss America pageant, right? You don't want to be Miss Idaho. Oh. This is like a really old joke that I just failed at retelling. Uh, have you well, heard that I've, heard, I've heard people say, oh, Idaho, Idaho. You got to do something with that, right? And then something, something potato. Yeah, that's something that's pretty classic. I feel like Ebonics is not really like a popular term anymore. I don't either. really understand the term. It's like a uh, language that. Would be typically associated oh, with black people, okay, right? Okay, yeah. I think I've only read it and not heard it. They used said to like talk about it on the news, like it was like a real thing. Okay. Now they call it A A V E. Okay. African American vocabulary, something I forget. Yeah. Okay, I understand now. I'm caught up. English. I understand what you're saying. The E is English. Okay. <laughs> I also don't want to be putting myself out here like I'm totally qualified to talk about black shit. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Idaho. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> So okay, how was that being homeschooled? Do you recommend homeschooling? Uh, yes. It was actually. Good. I mean, my parents' life. I was extremely religious. I was very devout. Homeschooled. Didn't have access to the outside world. Mm. Very patriarchal. Like I was expected to be a housewife child. Uh, you know, we weren't allowed to watch media that had depictions of children being rebellious against their parents, so we wouldn't get any crazy ideas. So it was mm. like a super lockdown kind of life. Um, but besides that point, I think like the actual homeschooling was pretty good. Uh, right. Mostly because it allows self-direction and a lot of freedom, which I think was great for developing a lifelong appreciation of learning. Yeah, I like because I've had people suggest to me like you should in homeschool your kid at a certain point, and I'm just like it just sounds crazy to me because in my mind, your childhood is going through these phases of having to be in groups with other people that you like mostly didn't choose and then you have to be able to get along with them and you're going to be around some shitheads and you're going to be around some great kids that you form lifelong friendships with hopefully and it just seems kind of crazy to me the idea of like shielding your kid from that and and being so controlling of their environment that to me would be a hard thing for me to wrap my head around but you, you that's well, not really how you think but, of schooling. I mean, school is very controlling of environment. So I was homeschooled for all the years, except for a couple months when I was 14. Uh -huh. And then I tried out school. And I was shocked at how much I was controlled by the environment. So you thought that you would love going to school. You were, like, fetishizing it. No, I wasn't. I think they, I think they, my parents told me that I had to. And I was really upset about it because I knew that you had to get naked in the locker rooms. Or, like, this is a <laughs> legend that I had heard. Because yeah. none of my friends had gone to school That either. was something I was hella scared of by the time I got to the end of elementary school is like yeah, that was like too? that was a big difference yeah, yeah like you're gonna be naked in that locker room yeah, with a bunch really of dudes you're terrifying. gonna see each other's penises for the first time yeah and around that point i hadn't even looked at my vagina i didn't even know i had a vagina until i was like 11 years old so 11? like 11 yeah so you just peed and just didn't even wonder what was going on down there yeah i just i we were told that your genitals are very dirty you're not supposed to look at them <sighs> or touch at them and i really took this to heart 
And I just wow. didn't know. And then my mom sat me down one day and she was like, you have an extra hole down there, honey. And I was like, what? Except without the swear words, because I didn't know what swear words were. Right. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that's the fucked up part, dude. That, yeah. like, you're just going to be able to not even let your kid know that fuck exists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy to me. <laughs> it took a long time for me to figure out what swear words were. My kid's three and she's already said fuck to me. Yeah. But I she, doesn't know, she doesn't know what she's saying and we don't react to it. So then she doesn't repeat it. Yeah. But it's a little scary. Like, oh, shit. She's going to figure out that that's like an extra cool word at some point. Yeah, he got to go through a phase of saying it a whole lot. I did. I kind of I'm still not over that phase. Um, Whenever I listen to a song that prominently features the N word, I and she's around, I, I fear the day yeah. that that's going to come out of her mouth, and I'm going to have to have a whole talk with her about that. Yeah, and we're just uh, the F word of five decades ago. The, yeah. Wait. Just the, the level F of F word meaning. F <laughs> uh, the oh, okay. So. F five decades ago was like the n-word now yeah just Matt, gee, i don't know if you ever were around very conservative culture well that is a good point because i guess 50 years ago the n-word was not as big a deal as it yeah. is now it was like kind of freely yeah. used to language changes it's up. but right. yeah uh, homeschooling was great mainly i went to school and then they were they, I took so long to learn anything. Like walking into class, sitting in class, the teacher slowly goes through things. The entire school day, I could have done in like maybe two hours at home. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, all this time is wasted that I could have been done. And what I was doing otherwise was like learning hobbies, teaching myself random skills, learning to unicycle, writing shit tons of fiction, reading books nonstop. And like that, just the, my opportunity to pursue that and figure out what I actually wanted was completely eviscerated when, during the couple of months I was in public school. Oh, I think it's a kind of a big tragedy. And to be clear, as a homeschooler, we had had a bunch of other homeschooled friends so i was getting socialized like pretty decently right as well that is a good point yeah because yeah. i guess either way the kid would be around like you know the neighbors and the other like you would just form friend groups and shit yeah we had like school. a weekly like all the mo homeschool moms would get together and like teach each other little classes while the kids played but the crazy shit about being in a major city is doing the whole private school song and dance it's like unbelievably competitive and like weird. It's like a pipeline from preschool to kindergarten to elementary to high school, like where you want to get your kid in at an early stage because being in one of the better private schools for preschool or whatever will help them as time goes by to get into better schools. And it's so unbelievably competitive to get into the best private schools. Why do you want to be in a best private school? So my kid doesn't end up huffing nitrous all day with a bunch of oh so it's like preventing kids. them from being exposed to kids who are having nitrous well just in general like i mean i guess you want to get your kid into the best private school so that they can get the best education and go to the best college and get the best jobs and okay it's like what else are you going to do did you go to college not like that i went for like <laughs> two i went to one year at community college and i went to umass lowell for one year and then i dropped out because yeah. i was making money doing credit card scams <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to move to New York and make BMX videos. <laughs> but you want your kids to go to college? Yeah, you know, if she wants to. For sure, I would like to like have the door have the option, open yeah. for that. I don't really, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I'm kind of scared about with college and shit. But I mean, what else, what else are they going to do? What are you scared about with college? That she's going to get the woke mind virus, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if my kid goes to college and becomes like a Palestinian rebel, then... I'm not going to be too <laughs> stoked. Like, what the f am I? I'm seriously bankrolling this. I'm paying for this shit. And she's like in a tent in the front of the school. Okay. Yeah. I wonder what percentage of the population of that age is into the Palestinian tenting thing. Because, oh, like, it, the absolute risk might be kind of low. Yeah. But they'll have something else by then. Yeah, probably. Some but this is such a thing kids do. You know, were you insane when you were like college age? Were you like an activist about anything? Mm, I used to read like anarchist pamphlets and like thought it was cool to like uh, be homeless and like shoplift and stuff. I didn't actually do it, but I was like reading about it and I thought it was kind of cool. Oh, no, I was vegan. I was like straight edge. You, know? you probably would have like, been a really weird religious kid. If you had been brought up like hardcore religious, I bet you would have taken the religion and like run pretty far with it. Yeah, I feel like I my whole life was like waiting to be introduced to atheism because as soon as I got like a, the smallest little taste of yeah. like atheist writings, I was like, that's me. That's me. That's 100% <laughs> yeah. me. That's how I feel about polyamory. Yeah. I was like, didn't know polyamory was a thing and then somebody mentioned it and I was like instantly, as soon as I heard the concept, I'm like, ah, mm. that is what I am. Really? Yeah. See, that, that to me and my girl is like, we're almost like the face of polyamorous relationships probably in a lot of people's eyes or at least one of the faces just because that whole thing was so viral last year but we're actually not like that at all like we do it on camera 
and like never otherwise. <laughs> and the idea of like me going and spending time with another girl is like totally foreign. Okay. Like she would never go for that. It's so more like an open relationship kind of thing. It's more like a content thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah, a lot of people in a lot of people's brains that doesn't count, right? Like people can't conceive of that as a difference. But when I was on the whatever pod and I was like, yeah, you know, we're monogamous besides on camera. They like just chose this as like the the best dunk they could possibly get on me. It's like, how is that monogamous <laughs> when your wife's get? F- and it's like, like what the f- did I say? And it's like I don't even have like the patience to have these kind of conversations on camera because it's like so obvious to me that you're like intentionally not understanding what I'm yeah. saying because it's so fucking obvious. It's like we're monogamous. And then we do other stuff on camera. Yeah. And for the most part, that's 99% of our thing. Well, like a, once in a blue moon, we'll have like an off camera threesome, but never with a dude. That would be. Yeah. I mean, have to yeah. wrap my head around. Yeah. Sounds super, sounds mostly monog to me. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. Like, so, okay. You're not in a relationship right now. Correct. But if you were in a relationship, it's easy for you to imagine yourself on a, this is always like the example that gets me. It's a Friday night and I'm going to the club with some random girl while my wife stays home and reads a book mm-hmm. and I'm out there getting drunk, having sloppy sex with some random girl. Mm-hmm. You'd be okay being the wife at home reading the book. Cause I don't think my girl's going for that. Yeah. See, I don't know. That just is kind of like inhuman to me. I just like, it's hard for me to wrap what my head around. What if you were going out with like friends? What if you're not having sloppy sex? You're just spending the same amount of time. You're uh, leaving. Okay. Well, yeah. Let's say I go out with friends and we're in the club and we're having a good time. Yeah. But then let's say that like, so I break it to you the next day. Like, hey, I f- a stripper. Yeah. I mean. And you'd just be like, wow, that's great. Let me smell yeah. your dick. That's super cool, yeah. yeah. Basically. Really? Yeah, sometimes yeah. like like I just my boyfriend and I just broke up due to like long term life plan differences, but uh, our relationship is really good. Um so it makes the breakup very tragic. But uh, he would like have his girlfriend over sometimes when we were hanging out and like once they like in the couch in front of me, you know. Uh and I'm like, Oh cool, have fun, you guys. Do you want photos? And then I like took photos and then like gave it to the girl so she could have photos. Like when I hear that though. I think my girl's totally okay with like watching me fuck another girl. It's more just like like if they're gone, she wants to feel like the alpha female. Like yeah. she has a an, a proactive involvement in whatever is going on sexually, and she's not having her spot challenged. Like like she got her tits done and wasn't able to shoot for a while, so I had to do a few of the only plugtalk.com uh episodes myself, just like me and other girls mm-hmm. and uh like me and another guy and another girl in a couple of the cases. And all the girls that I shot with were chicks that she's already shot with, that she's friends with, that she's trust has a trusting relationship with. And it also helps that she's just like seen how I am with girls and she knows that I don't give a f- and that I'm just very, I enjoy the sex part and I have no real interest in kicking it and picking your brain after. Yeah. This is not what I'm into. I'm like realistically going to go home and play poker and not give a f- about the girl that I just shot with, you know? Yeah. And to her, I feel like that gives her a level of comfort. But in terms of it just being like a real life thing, like the idea of me picking and choosing to spend time with another girl instead of her, I think is the thing that would be very weird for us to get past. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. You want to have some sort of sense of security about your status. And I think I have some degree of this too. Like with my ex-partner, I really wanted to feel like, am I like kind of the number one and if not i just need to know so that i can like emotionally adjust to it and it might be kind of hard although i did he started did starting dating this one other girl and then she and i became really good friends mm. and then once she and i became super good friends i was like i've experienced a desire for her to like become like the second primary i was like i want us to be both equal sister wives mm. you know we can all live together uh, and it was like really cool to feel my feelings around this shift and i'm like oh is this just like if i don't feel like i'm in competition with her if i feel like the Nedamar and I are very aligned. Like, does that make me okay? But how long are you seriously going to be on equal, on equal level with the other girl and the other dude? It just feels like almost impossible. It's like hard enough in a long-term relationship for a guy and a girl to stay on the same 
page but to then introduce another girl into it and to not assume that at some point his interest is not going to be 50 50 between you it's going to be 70 30 like that just feels like that would be so insurmountable i mean it might be painful but like sometimes pain is just part of life right yeah well but you seem like you don't have like a desire for security in the same way that my wife does where i feel like to her knowing that our situation is going to be all right a year from now three years from now five years from now is like a very big deal and she wouldn't want to introduce a situation that she thought had a high likelihood of and everything up yeah i guess that's true maybe like part of my security is like i don't anticipate these kinds of situations would something up right um and like i at least the part i'm thinking of i would trust like if he committed like yes i'm going to do a thing for three years at least i would trust him to hold to that Mm. um but I don't know. People have different like mate guarding paranoias, uh, which are I call paranoias that's dismissive. I just mean they're justified. Like they're quite evolutionarily beneficial hmm. in a lot of ways. For sure. Okay. Let's. I, I want to go through the timeline here a little bit more. So, do you go to college after you're done? Your like a couple months. So basically not. Yeah. Why did that not work out? Not of money. My parents made like a little bit too much money for me to qualify for for financial aid, and they uh, like refused to pay for anything, okay, um, or co-sign any loans. So, just because of their financial situation, or were they like objecting to higher education yeah, in some they, way? No, they were objecting to helping me. <laughs> <laughs> How many think, kids did you have? Uh, they had three. Okay. Yeah. But I think there's something like, oh, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps once you're an adult, like you're on your own in life. You know, it was very kind of like a rough, I mean, I was Calvinist, so it was like kind of this vibe of like, you know, you use your deep willpower to do whatever you need to do to make it by, and you can't rely on anybody else to help you. So they wanted you to go to college and also work a job and... Do yeah, the whole thing. I guess, well, I mean, they weren't really. It's like they would say that, but like also they would say things like, "Well, if you're going to go to college, the purpose is to find a husband so that you can marry him, and then how you get a little bit of education in college so that you can homeschool your children." Wow! So they taught you that from day one because yep. that's one thing that from day one, me and my girl, like, like as we saw our kid get into the princesses and realizing, like, oh man, like these books basically teach young girls that they're value is almost entirely like finding a prince and that really doesn't sit well with us because i want to raise a girl that's like self-sufficient and understands that she's you know if she's going to get into a relationship she needs to basically just like have spent the early part of her life bettering herself and becoming a good person so that a a guy would feel lucky to be in a relationship (laughs) with her which is like 100 percent not the lesson you get from a lot of these old disney stories that are not like intentionally evil but like snow white is weird as and i I view myself as somebody that like you know is probably closer to being okay with like traditional ideas of relationships and shit but some of the stuff in those disney books is (laughs) yeah but your parents like told you like your job in life is to find a man and to be his and have kids, backbone yeah. and have yeah, kids. Stay at home wife. Yeah. And you never questioned that? or I, I remember being pretty unhappy with it as a kid, which is kind of interesting, right? Because like I sort of have this idea that a lot of things that we're okay with or not okay with are generally cultural. Hmm. Like a lot of people, maybe they're told they're supposed to be a good housewife, but you know, they go to normal school and they're exposed to, you know, girl boss narratives. But I didn't have girl boss narratives. Like my like we generally watch media that was only produced like 60s or earlier because like anything 70s or forward was like a little bit too feminist. Wow. Um, and so we were allowed to watch some of it. Like SpongeBob, for example, it was fine. But really? uh, okay. most of my upbringing was spent, like I watched like all of G- I Dream of Jeannie and Gilligan's Island and I Love Lucy. Like that was my childhood. Um, I'm like old enough that we watched those shows because they were just like still kind of relevant. How old are you? 40. That's like not that old. Maybe I'm, Maybe it was mostly Nick at Night that I was watching like, no, but I remember a lot of like Gilligan's Island. And reruns. That sounds really good. But I remember watching Nick at Night, and it would have Mr. Ed. Yeah. The talking horse. Horse, horse, of course, yeah. of course. Nobody, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the shit that it was on Nick at Night is, like, ancient <laughs> in comparison to, like, the shit that kids are watching now. Yeah, it's pretty good. I, don't know, I wonder, do they even have Nick at Night? I don't know. There's got to be something on there. Um... Yeah, we were told. I was told stuff like women are more emotional. There was a debate over whether or not women should have the right to vote, and I was like, kind of leaning on like maybe women shouldn't be allowed to vote. Like women were considered to be like sort of weaker and like designed to be submissive. We were supposed to be women to men as men were to God. Do you re- resent your parents for putting that shit in your head? Uh, 
like a little bit yes and no. Like one, I don't have resentment for parents doing what they think is best. Like right. if you really love your child, but you're just misguided. I'm like, it sucks you're misguided, but I can tell it comes from a place of love. Right. There were other parts my parents did that was like extremely, um, that felt like it came from a place of like desiring to feel like you're controlling another person. And I have less empathy for that part. Really? Like yeah. what? They were just, it was just, we used the Growing Kids God's Way system, which is like an extremely strict and really controlling way of up, upbringing children. Like, uh, they started out with, like, you physically hit babies if they cry from, wow. like, dis, uh, if the cry seems to be defiant, right? So, like, kids are sinners, and you're you supposed the, to... Where, where do you hit the kid? Well, so if they're a baby baby, you hit, you slap them on the arms, and as soon as they graduate to toddlerhood, that you have a strip of, like, rough leather that you would use to hit them. And Even the, in the short term, though, if you hit, a, you hit the kids, it's going to make them cry more, right? Like that's one thing I learned with the kid is that you can never like escalate tensions. You got to always like try to. Right. But this is if they're, you, pu you usually punish them if they're like get mad about something that you told them to do. You know? Okay. So you're supposed to go right away, all the way and with a happy spirit it was like the song we had to do about obedience. So you had to Jesus. be happy when you obeyed. And if you were not happy when you obeyed, you would get like, you know, spanked. And the spankings were not fun. This isn't like cute people hitting somebody's butt. Uh, you'd be like, stop that, Jason, or whatever. It was like, it was like a piece of leather. And we had a rule that if we screamed too loud to alert the neighbors, we would get like another one. Wow. So it, the goal was to like, break your child's spirit or like change their heart, get through to their heart. They have to deeply want to be regretful about their actions. Basically just scare the f out of them and traumatize them to the <laughs> point that they won't do the thing again. Yeah, basically. I mean, if you're in sufficient pain, um, then your mind is going to eventually shift to like try become the kind of person that minimizes that amount of pain. See, I, wor I worry because I could never in a million years imagine hitting my daughter no matter what. If I have a son, I could never imagine hitting him until he starts to feel like a dude. And like, once he becomes a dude, then it's like, I just feel like as a dude, sometimes you gotta let another dude know what it is. And it's like, if, you, if you're a little too rebellious with me or you're like a little too disrespectful, and you're like a 16 year old boy. He's got to know about the hierarchy. For sure, I'm okay. gonna slap the shit out of you at some point. Yeah, like I don't know. Maybe, maybe 16 will feel so young that I couldn't do it. But like, once he becomes a man, what if he beats you he, up? Well, I didn't even think about that. By that yeah. point, you're probably no, gonna be problem, older yeah. and weaker. And I know, right? Because I remember my dad like beating my ass for like a good chunk of my childhood. But then like around like 18, it was like, and I never yeah. beat his ass, but I would like grab his wrists and just be like. No, like this ain't happening. Like, yeah, and I, I, but I, I sometimes regret that. I sometimes feel like I should have knocked him out once. Well, maybe your kid will knock you out. Ugh, yeah, I didn't think about that. <laughs> I'm just kind of imagining it'll be like a bitch, but. <laughs> well, was, is your wife girthy? No, she's tiny. Okay, well then maybe your kid will be tiny then. My daughter's very tall. Uh, well, then maybe you're fucked. So that is weird to think yeah. like, oh my God, she's going to be like a WNBA chick. <laughs> like what if she has high testosterone at some point? Yeah. That's crazy. Um, okay, so college sucked and you dropped out to do what? I worked at a factory on a factory floor. In Idaho? Yeah, assembling <laughs> electrical relays for a year. And what did you think of this time? Like, it's not fun. I don't like recommend. It. it really sucked. Really fucking sucked. Uh, I mean, I was waking up before the sun and then going to bed, the sun goes down and I was drinking a lot because it's like, you're just trying to de-stress after that. And it's weird that other people seem to not have that bad a time with it. I would go around and my coworkers would be like, yep, this is life. This is my 10th year on the job. And I'd be like, I just was so dissatisfied with that. I'm like, I don't want to spend my life doing this, but I didn't know any other way. Like again, homeschooler in Idaho, isolated from normal culture. Like I did not have a concept of any way to climb through the world. This is just really alien to me. So mm. I'm like, to my, in my mind, the thing that you do to become successful is you work really hard on a factory floor and maybe they promote you in five years and then you get like a $1 raise. So your parents never introduced you to the concept of having like ambition to become something bigger? No, it's supposed to be a housewife. Right. Yeah. But then how are you going to meet a dude when you're just living this normal ass existence? Well, you go briefly to college and find some sweet Christian man doing some basic ass job. So you were in a relationship at this time when you're working in the factory? Uh, yeah, I was. At this point, I wasn't Christian anymore, though. Oh, yeah. when did you ditch that? And uh, like right parents, before I turned 19. How'd they feel about it? 
uh, not great. I mean, it sucks if you genuinely believe your child's going to burn in hell for eternity. Yeah, like you, it, that that is pretty sad from their perspective. It's weird for me because my girl's sister is very religious, and her kids go to church every Sunday, and my kid doesn't even know what church is yet. And at some point, my kid is going to figure out that I think this whole church thing is goofy as fuck and that I think that this whole God thing is a joke. Mm-hmm. And uh, I imagine that being kind of weird because kids are not good at keeping secrets. So I can imagine that at some point. It's oh, is like, it a secret to your sister-in-law that you think church is goofy? I just don't want my kid to like tell her cousins. Why like, not? Oh, like you guys like Jesus and shit. And my dad thinks that shit's dumb as fuck. Like, I just feel like I don't want her to have that conversation with her cousins, but probably at some point. But well, why don't she, why don't she want this? Cause she's like three and a half, but like maybe she's like 12. And it'll yeah. be like confusing for her at three. I just don't want her to be like involved or like arguing with her cousins about religion in general. It just feels like at some point it's going to become kind of obvious to her of like, Oh, my parents are like a hundred percent not into this thing. That's like super important to your cousins. Yeah. And I just imagine that being a little bit of a collision at some point. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what growing up is. It's a series of uncomfortable collisions. And I'm going to have to totally sugarcoat my views on religion to my kid for a substantial amount of time. I'm so negative towards religion that I just don't think it's like, it's it's too much for a kid to understand. Why is it too much? Well, imagine telling her that like, hey, there's another religion that's even worse than the one that your cousins are. Why not? Because she's too little to understand. Like, I don't want her to like... be confused about what you mean. It's too much. You keep saying too much. I think you got to like stagger what you teach your kid about. Like you just don't want your kid to be like fully armed with all this information at a young age, right? I mean, you could say something like, well, your dad believes this. You could disagree with me. Yeah, for sure while, I'm going like, to say that, that but I don't know if I agree with that. Because <laughs> I think if my kid like is into God, that I'm going to be like, yo, you know you're f***ing up, right? <laughs> like, you know that's just bullshit, yeah, right? Like, I'm not going to just let that go. All right, if you genuinely don't want her to believe things that are different from you, then this does sound like it would cause more conflict. Well, I mean, you got to give them like a base to start from, right? I mean, I, ideally the base should be like curiosity. Like, hey, here are the tools that we use to make sense of the world. Hmm. And you're, you, you're, I would like to teach you good tools and you might use those to arrive at different conclusions. What but I just kid, want you to be using the good tools. What if your kid gets into like Holocaust denialism real early? Then you got to coax them out of that, that foxhole, well, right? But okay, okay. I know this sounds insane, but like there are reasons people believe insane things. And if you try and just shame the thing out of them, it's not going to like deeply update them. Definitely don't shame. Yeah. Yeah. So it should be like, okay, so why do you believe in Holocaust denial? Let's in, explore that. In the that. words of our Lord and Savior, Taylor Swift, shame never made anybody less gay. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Which I also disagree with, because I think there's probably a whole shitload of people out there that... They'll behave less gay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, but then what is gay, truly? Not really, like, the best yeah. way to accomplish that, yeah. She is our Lord and Savior. Um, wait, okay, what were you saying before I did the weird Taylor remember. Swift segue? I also don't really know much about Taylor Swift. Really? Wow, yeah. I'm missing out. That's like the tie that binds all white women together right now. Ah, I see. My wife went to Vienna to see the Eras tour because it's not coming back to America. Mm -hmm. And ISIS, they picked up three ISIS combatants who were planning a bombing. And so she did not get to see. Who's they? Like the government? Oh, well, yeah, the the Austrian government. Okay. In coordination with the Secret Service, I believe. Taylor Swift. I, I believe we supplied the information about these guys. Um, but then th- these concerts didn't happen. Wow. So she went all the way to Vienna and ISIS got in the way of her seeing her see. hero. I see. It's like the anti of the white woman. Yeah. I mean, they, ISIS, they just kind of like latch on to like whatever's going on in pop culture, I think. <laughs> you know, they just want to like attach themselves to some viral shit. Yeah, that makes sense. Good PR. But Taylor Swift didn't even issue a statement about it, really, because she didn't want to like... Yeah, it makes sense. You don't want to feed. Even Taylor Swift's not is scared shitless of ISIS. Well, I mean, even if it's not fear, it's like you just don't want to like give people more attention to latch onto. If you react in any way to like an insane stalker, I just want to live in a world in which Taylor Swift can say like on stage, "Hey, f- ISIS." <laughs> 
Would that be so sick? That would be nice. That would be so badass. <laughs> But yeah, she would for sure have a target on her head after that. Yeah, yeah. That's some chicken shit shit. I feel like ISIS is used to people saying f- them, though. It's not like more generic, mm. like you can't draw Muhammad type stuff. That, that'll that definitely get you killed. Yeah, and that's f- up too. Yeah, I agree. But hey, I'm not I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I, me neither. Which is kind of bitch made. Yeah. Because I think everybody should have every right to do so. But yeah. I don't really want the smoke, you know. I don't want to get salmon rushed. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. You gotta have a line somewhere. I feel like I'm very bold online. I say a bunch of like weird, insane shit, but there's definitely like ultimately some lines where I'm like, if I get killed for saying this, I'm just not gonna. Right. No, yeah. I heard about that dude trying to kill you. That's crazy. Yeah. And so he's locked up now? Well, he's out now. He oh. was locked up. Really? You don't have a gun? I can either confirm or deny hmm. my ownership of guns. I think we need to arm women. That would, I agree. Yeah, when people are like, oh, we shouldn't have guns, I'm like, uh, women. Have you never guns. been in a, pers- in a situation where you need one? And, and if yeah. not, if not guns, like, you know, pepper spray, knives. knives I, like I am almost never without a they weapon. They backfire. Isn't there a saying like there's no winner in a knife fight? Man, I got some, some good videos I could show you at the or, chicken shops in London. Okay. <laughs> So they, they just like they, they they hit the overhand like you'll see the dudes just going like this just aiming right for the fucking jugular yeah and if they get you right you'll bleed out in like ten seconds it's crazy I would do you ever like imagine you'd be a warlord in like Mongolia if you'd been born there because you kind of strike me as like like high risk taking <laughs> see like procreate a lot but like not not that you're not the father but like I could see you just like having a harem or something. For sure, I think I could have got into whatever f***ed up criminal behavior I got introduced to at a young age. Because mm-hmm. I remember somebody suggested to me when I was like 19 or 20, like, yo, like, yeah, I know this dude. And he'll he'll, he'll give you like 10 or 15,000 or whatever to like drive a car to Montreal and like drive over the border with like the car stuffed full of X pills. And I remember my reaction being like, oh, f- yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> like, I'll for sure, ten grand, yeah. I will do that for sure. And when I think about that as a grown man, I'm just like, holy shit! Like, you were just born to be a crash dummy if you were just down to do like any dumbass scheme that got put in front of you. So I feel very lucky that I got introduced to shit like BMX bikes and fucking hardcore music and shit at a young age. That was mm-hmm. like, ru- like, gave me some danger and like sense of like thrill. But sometimes I'll be interviewing dudes and they'll just be like, yeah. And then like when I was 15, I met this like older dude and he, he, he did meth and he like gave me a gun and like told me to go rob somebody. And like that just kind of became my thing after that. And I'm like, oh, shit, that's uh, so you're pretty close for sure. Like if somebody had introduced yeah. me to that, I grew up in an area with no gangs. It was like one like Dominican gang, <laughs> but like white dudes don't really not really known for their gang banging. And uh, well, you know. The ones that I was around in New Hampshire, at least. Okay. Yeah, I don't think of New Hampshire as something that has gangs. For sure they're out there, but they're not. Okay. Probably not really, like, measuring up to the Crips. I feel like white dudes don't really get into their gangster shit until they, like, hit prison and then or, or jail even, and then that kind of, like... You, like, you can't actually keep, like, dropping references to things, right? Like, if I wanted to deeply understand the thing that you just said, I need to unpack quite a lot. Right. Like, I feel like a little bit like I'm on a movie set. I'm that captivating. Uh, you're that like con- alien or something. Well, I just know about a lot Wait, of you're, weird you're shit. You're alien in yeah. some ways, but not alien in others. Like uh, you're like you seem low class to me. <laughs> uh, which <laughs> hell yeah, no. <laughs> to be I'm clear, not, I, I can't deny that. To be clear, at all. I am low class. Like okay, uh, like I think there's something where it's like a lot of the folks I hang around these days, it's like, oh, you know, I grew up and then my, my parents paid for my Ivy League education and now I'm a doctor. Right. Right. Uh, and there's a way where you clearly have a lot of life experience that is not common to people of this class. Uh, and so, and I'm like very different from you. I don't even know how gangs work or anything. Hmm. But I also have this sense of alienation from like upper classes in that people will talk very casually about getting an academic grant. And I'm like, what is that? Right. Uh, so there's a way where I feel like simultaneously kind of alien from you, but also like not. I don't know. Wow. I'm a trip, ain't I? That's indeed. crazy. Indeed. It's very unusual. Wow. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. I never, uh, I don't know. The people I grew up around, 
probably a huge percentage of them thought that they would do at least some college, but there definitely wasn't definitely wasn't this yeah. idea of like you're gonna can go to like the top notch college whereas like yeah. a lot of the parents that I'm around now that's very much the expectation is, which is cool it means yeah. you've like climbed in class right yeah. yeah which is weird but it's like I got there in a scummy way by doing porn and interviewing <laughs> rappers yeah it's very yeah I have a very similar like a sense of strangeness like sometimes I'm in these groups and I'm like I'm the only person who got here from doing a very low class thing because normally right. you don't climb ranks by doing a low class thing very well right no yeah that doesn't usually happen and it, it, sometimes it's weird I, I tried to explain this the other day to one of my co-hosts this dude brick baby of the rolling 60s neighborhood crips he's a nice guy don't worry but i gotta hype him up like that just so you know that he's like a real deal okay but so those words wool, mean nothing to me okay okay i know that crips is a reference to a gang a gang so he was a member of this game he was and is yeah in, in the past well, okay, sure. And, but he was a successful member of this gang? I would say he had some success. <laughs> like, like, uh, like a, what percentile? Was he like a mob uh, boss? No, it's not like that. Okay. It's just kind of like <laughs> everybody is this thing. And like, yeah, there's some people that are like revered and have power, okay. but it's it's not like. But he's like mid range. It's not super it's like a mid -range formal. Crap. Well, I, I wouldn't say that he. Yeah, I mean, he's not like out here trying to be. King of the Crips or anything. Okay. <laughs> but okay. But I, my, I told him that as much as I'm a square, I'm the square guy in the room when I'm around him and a lot of the other guys that he hangs out with and people that we interview and shit. But when I'm in the private school arena, for sure, I read. I was yeah, like yeah. the sketchy, grizzly, weird white yeah. guy that like obviously has like you know because a lot of the people I'm around like they work in like TV and shit. It's like yeah, just yeah, okay. an so you know the feeling where you got to wear khakis to work. I assume I don't. Do really you wear know. khakis? From time to time, I guess if I yeah. had some khakis, I would rock it. Yeah, but I just kind of wear the same pants over and over. And I'll okay. do I'll post like 15 photos of like 15 different interviews I did, and I'll be wearing the same pants in every single picture, and people will make fun of me. Oh, okay. But I really feel like I can wear the same pair of pants for like yeah, I have the same months. I just wore the same dress for approximately eight days before I got here. A dress? Exactly. It's not even making contact with your vagina. I know. I switched out the underpants. So yeah, I mean that's yeah. all you got to do. Yeah. Yeah, basically, it was pretty stinky though. Yeah, I mean I'm just not a person that like really cares that much about staying clean in between going out in public. Oh, yeah. Like if I'm around the crib, like if I get home from work Friday night. There is a decent chance that if we don't go out and do anything, if we don't go to dinner or we don't go, like, you know, meet up with another family to hang out or whatever, I might not take a shower until, like, uh, Monday morning uh, or, like, Sunday morning. Okay, so, just for, why, why am I here? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, oh, actually, you want to know what's funny is, like, I there's a dude who's, like, a No Jumper fan, and uh, he just always suggests people for me to interview, mm -hmm. and I think I, like, he, like, Pitched me like, hey, you should interview this person, and you like sent me a bunch of info and stuff, and I was like, yeah, fuck it, let's do it. All right. Did he include the fact that I'm somewhat famous for not showering? He did mention that. Okay. Um, I, 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 I want to ask about that. I just want to check if there was yeah. like pre-existing. So okay, where does that come from? Was that something you were brought up with? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we can bond over this because yeah, because dude, I get so much shit for not showering, right. and then I don't think it's a big deal. It really, really, and, isn't. and you seem like there's a bunch of like white celebrities and shit in the news for not showering and like talking there about. Are? How, uh, who was it? Do you remember? I forget. It was like some movie star that like they don't shower like they it's don't think it's more common than you think but nobody says it out loud because everybody makes fun of you I, I think I could probably google this celebrity celebrity doesn't Jake sh shower Jake Gyllenhaal <laughs> that is the first one that pops up. And then Brad Pitt, Ashton Kutcher, Dax Shepard, who's like the most famous white man in the world. <laughs> yeah, Ashton it's Kutcher, overrated. Mila Kunis. I mean, these are some fly fucking white people. I, I mean, I'm not mad at being in their league. <laughs> I don't I don't know any Wait, so of them. How often do you shower? Um, Honestly, I shower every time I come to do the podcast or every time I go to do porn. It's a very important part of my yeah, morning right. ritual. Like, I work out in the morning, I eat breakfast, I shower, then I go to work. But if, for whatever reason, I'm just sitting around the house all day, if I'm just going to be on the computer answering emails, yeah, I don't why? feel the need yeah. to take a shower. And that apparently is, like, shocking to some people. Also, I don't shower oh, yeah. before bed. 
I shower in the morning, but I don't shower before bed. And some people find this very shocking. Like, oh, <laughs> you, you shouldn't want to get the bed dirty. I'm like, I don't, I don't feel like I'm that. I understand what dirty. is dirty? You're just, it's just skin and like a tiny bit of skin oil. Like this is not gross. I, yeah, yeah, I do not understand people's disgust responses. My housekeeper is changing the sheets like right. once a week, maybe, maybe more. Right. I don't even know. I have no, no clue how often she changes the sheets, but I, it seems sufficient. Yeah. I don't get into the bed and feel like Ew, oily, gross. Uh, yeah. Right. Some maybe it's psychological for some people. I wonder if it's placebo. If people like just kind of feel gross, but I don't know. I feel like skin is good at protecting itself or something. And I have better skin when I don't shower all the time. I think that a lot of people have this weird, like they believe that they are the kind of person who showers a lot and they just have to fulfill that, that yeah. they just believe that this is so important. To me, it's a sign that you are not busy enough because to me, I think showering probably takes me 15 minutes in total, mm -hmm. which is not that much, but it's like, there's a lot of other things I want to be yeah, doing. Yeah, it's also boring and annoying, and it it's feels boring. bad. Yeah. yeah. You're using the shampoo, and then you got to buy more at some point. I realize it's almost right. zero dollars per shower, but it still just feels, I don't know. I just don't really, unless I'm going to be having sex or like doing the podcast. But then also, like one time, my house flooded. It rained really bad, mm -hmm. and our driveway filled, and the house flooded and stuff. And I had to come in here and do a podcast without showering. And the people dropped comments. They, they could tell. Which seems weird well, to me. I feel like you should not be able to tell that. Okay, I I've also stopped using soap on my body, except for my butthole. Okay. But I, my my theory is when I use soap, uh, it makes me smell worse afterwards. Really? So what I do is I just use a wet washcloth. I like scrub my armpits really hard, and then I use like this like silver thing, which helps like prevent bacteria formation, okay. and it makes me smell much better. Like it makes me go, go much longer before I start getting stinky and needing a shower. I'm going to be honest, like, I've put so little thought into the soap and shampoo that I use in my day-to-day -day life. And, like, right now, the deodorant that I'm using is, like, do you know who Jake Paul is? Yeah. He's a YouTuber. He started, like, a brand called, like, W or some shit. Okay. And, like, they sent me, like, some deodorant in the mail, and I've been using it. And, I honestly, it's, it's kind of, like, dry and chalky and... <laughs> It doesn't really feel anywhere near as good as the old spice that I was using previously, but I'm still just using it because I just don't even really care. Yeah, I don't think it matters that much. I could be a no deodorant guy. Honestly, a couple of the girls in the porn industry, like the hottest chicks, don't wear deodorant. I think I kind of, okay, after, a lot of my friends don't shower that much either, and I don't think we're particularly stinky, but occasionally you get, like, more whiffs of, like, what somebody actually smells like, and it's starting to grow in me. I'm like, oh, wait, if I'm around this a lot, I'm starting to like, really enjoy it and getting a lot of information from these scents. Mm. Um, and so I'm sad that we're sort of missing out on this culturally. I can think of two porn stars I've had sex with and one girl back in the day in Brooklyn who was just such a hipster weirdo that she didn't shower, and it's, it is weird, because it's like... <laughs> For sure, if you're f***ing for like 15 minutes, you're going to think about it probably like within every minute. You're going to think about that scent that's hitting your nose. You're thinking about her. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like that shit stinks. And it also like, <laughs> I don't know, I, I associate it with like dirty vagina. Oh, you got the hairy armpits too. Yeah, okay. yeah. How's that going I don't think you? I'm stinky right now. Can you smell me from there? Yeah. What is that? Can I smell it? No, no, I can't smell no, okay. it from over here. Okay, okay, just checking. No. Wait, look at that. But I feel like I. Oh, see, look, look oh, at yeah, that Jake yeah, Paul deodorant on there. I see. I think this might not look like that too. I put a whole bunch. Of, whatever. People are gonna like think of us as just being like the definition of just weird white people for just talking, like spending this much time talking down on showering. I feel like yeah. within the black community, anytime I say anything about how I don't find showering that captivating, it's just one hundred percent. Disgust, <laughs> like absolute no, horror. We're at the forefront of a movement, and horror is what you expect when you are the flag bearers Stank for what ass will lives eventually matter. take over culture. I bet you, in like fifty years, assuming that we live that long and don't all die in a horrific apocalypse, that we're going to see a grand cultural acceptance of showering less. But the thing is, is that like corporations are so incentivized to like sell us on the notion that we need these chemicals and products to make ourselves smell good. Yeah, this is true. I know fully grown ass men with like facial care routines, zesty facial routines. Okay, zesty is not spicy. Zesty is just homosexual. Gay ish. Okay. Yeah, gay adjacent. Like just to me as a person who's 
never even really thought about what I'm washing my face with. Like I ran out of face soap and I've just been using like the, the kids like all in one body slash mm -hmm. body soap or whatever. I've just been using that because I just don't. Do you have really low neuroticism? Describe that. Like, <laughs> like on the big five, you know, the ocean personality test? No. Okay, ocean is a person. It's one of the best replicated personality tests out there. So if you're going to like learn about yourself, you should probably use that one. Okay. But one of the factors is neuroticism, which is basically how responsive are you to negative stimuli? I feel like I'm completely oblivious to it yeah, at this go. point. So low neuroticism probably. I've been too destroyed in the media, by social media okay, at this point. I just feel like I'm probably like top 1% of not giving a f what people say about me, which is... I bet it's correlated to not showering and using whatever three-in-one deodorant. Like whatever psychological trait you have that's like, whatever, people are saying bullshit about me. It's probably like, whatever, I don't care what deodorant I use on my armpits. Yeah, ambivalent. Yep. That does kind of feel like I relate to that. Yeah, yeah. I'm also pretty low neuroticism. I have a theory that like people who are very promiscuous are bimodal in neuroticism, meaning basically that like uh, they tend to either be very neurotic or not neurotic at all. I don't know if this is true. That's interesting. I could probably test it. Actually, I have the data on it, but I haven't looked at it yet. I mean, I do think that like okay, there's there's two different like personas that like a female porn star or sex worker can take on, which is basically like I don't give a f like I'll let almost anyone f and I feel like this is kind of I've heard you say stuff like this is like I like just f new people mm -hmm. and then like there's other porn star chicks where the persona is more like I'm only f high value men and you see this where it's like on one side you have girls that are doing f a fan contests and basically lying on their social media acting as if like oh I just went on I went to the club and I brought home five guys of f these random dudes and then you have other girls that their brand is strictly like I f these high value BBC dudes. Okay, but my theory is I'm somewhere in the middle here. Like, my theory is that, like, a female brain typically has, like, two brains. One is the horny brain, like, the, the thing that's, like, the equivalent to what men have. Mm -hmm. And then you have, like, the lady brain, which is being, like, hey, no, honey, don't do that. Is he high value enough? You know, it's the thing that makes you not want to get pregnant with a horrible man's baby, you know. People without lady brain died out. So you have these two brains. Uh, and then, like, some people have, like, different strengths of each one. Um, and I think I have, like, a quite a high lady brain. The th part of my brain that, like, tries to filter what I have sex with is very strong. Mm -hmm. I just am, like, unusually good at developing unusual scenarios that get around my lady brain. Okay. Like, I probably wouldn't have casual sex with most people, but if I structure some sort of world, for example, a default consent orgy where everybody who arrives wears wristbands that indicate default consent, or like a CNC orgy, which, so I run a series of these. And these are really effective for me having sex with a lot of people. But I have to have this elaborate structure. Or like escorting is great for me, because if somebody's paying me sufficient money, it's like bribing my lady brain to like mm. go away and, ha and sit down. It's like, oh, uh, we have like sufficiently made this man jump through some sort of abstract hoop. But so you're escorting and like some fucking 400 pound micro penis dude shows up. Yeah, I don't mind. You actually don't mind? You're not like, like when I see this dude, I'm, now I'm gonna picture mm -hmm. the female version of this, I feel repulsed looking at them. Yeah, I don't think I have that. At all? Like, there's no man that you could be repulsed by his naked body. No, but I also have a weird thing where I have like a like a disgust fetish for gross men, but it's a little bit separate. Uh, but definitely, a lot of my fantasies involve like a horrific, like disgusting guy. You know, like having <laughs> sex with me against my will. I think it's very hot. Whoa, really? So it does help. <laughs> but but also, I don't actually experience disgust. Most of the unpleasant clients I have sex with are not unpleasant or don't actually disgust me enough to trigger that fetish. I don't know. It's just a person. You think your Overton window of like who you're willing to sleep, be attracted to is just pretty big? Yeah. Well, I don't have to be attracted to clients to have sex with them. Hmm. I, I like most of them. A lot of male porn stars I've heard say the same thing, which is basically like, I can always find something to be attracted to. Whether it's like... You know, when you're bent over uh, and, yeah. and your ass has like spread out enough that it, you can't see the cellulite it's only ripples. A hole now. It's like the smoothness yeah. of the skin. Or like she has pretty eyes or <laughs> you know, her, her breast implants feel good when you squeeze them. That'll that'll let me power through this. <laughs> this is probably different for men than women, right? Cuz like as a guy you have to have a hard on. Yeah. Imagine summoning a and hard on when you're yeah, not attracted at I do all think to the person. Way harder to have sex with an escort if I had to have a hard penis.
I, I don't know the true extent of it, but for sure, a lot of dudes are shooting up their dicks. This is what I hear. Now, are you talking injection or just like taking Viagra? No, I'm talking there's like this weird thing. I forget what it's called, but you like mm. prick your dick with it and it'll make you have like a rock hard Yeah, I did have erection. one client, very old, and he had like prostate cancer or something, so he had to use that. Yeah, yeah like one day... Uh, Last year, I interviewed a male porn star who was telling me all about it, and then I interviewed like a 65-year-old bank robber who told me he used it. And it's like, it's intended for the 65-year-old dude who can't get hard without it, but then male porn stars are doing it because it oh, wow. makes their job extremely easy in comparison. But I feel like if you do it a lot, you're going to like basically like burn out your own ability to do get hard on it. your own. Right? And, and dudes say that about Viagra and shit too. Mm -hmm. that when you take a lot of it, you kind of, it just becomes difficult to get hard without it. Huh, I didn't know this was the case. It was good to know. I know dudes who carry Viagra around at all times yeah. because there's no chance of them getting hard without it. I only ever took it once. Not even Viagra, some other random version. That Cialis it, or something? It wasn't. It was a different brand name. It was yeah. just like a sponsor we had or whatever. I only took it one time. It was just fucking crazy. <laughs> Like nuts. Like my dick was so hard for like 24 hours. You look like you've seen war. That's how I felt off that dick pill. And after I shot the scene with the dick, it was because I had to shoot two uh, plug talk scenes in a day. And the second mm -hmm. one, I wasn't feeling uh, like my dick was going to be like, I felt like I could probably get through it, but I felt like, let me just take this pill that will make me a monster. <laughs> and then I had to do an, like a three hour interview with a rapper named FBG Buddha after that. Can you say that name again? FBG Buddha. Okay. He's from like a crew called FBG and then his name is Buddha. Okay. Anyway, I had to do a three hour interview with him while the fucking dick pill was still just coursing through my veins. Did he notice? <sighs> Did you tell him? Did you show it to him? I think I didn't tell him until after. Okay. No, I, he's not the kind of guy you'd want to show your too. Oh, okay. Yeah. He might, uh, just kidding, but, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Where were we? <laughs> I don't know. Dude, I shouldn't, I, I got high before this interview too. Yeah. This was always a weird decision. On for what? Me. Kush. Weed. Just smokes weed. Are you currently high? Yeah. A little bit. Not like crazy, but. Yeah. Is it making your thoughts more varied? It's making me think that things are funnier than I would normally think oh, they that's were. that's lovely. Yeah. Like I think I'm, like, not very good at humor, so. Really? I like it when people, like, throw me a snort. A chortle. A snort. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you play any of the uh, New York Times games on a daily basis? I do not. I subscribe. And there's a, this game called Connections, and there's, like, just all these words. Let me show you. And you have to fucking, like, sort them together. And it's very... Uh, You have to like think about sort of like abstract connections between these words. I wish I could show this to the people out there. Actually, I will. I will screenshot it and send it to Donnie. But like, okay, we're gonna put this on screen. Four groups of four. You. I want to know what your first guess is. Wait. So you have to like things. These you're gonna. These are gonna be in categories together of like different things. How do I? And a lot of if you tap it, it'll turn a different color. But don't press enter because I want to know what your first guess is. I feel Wait, like I don't, okay. So I have to create four groups of four. Do I just click four? No, it's, you're you're, and then, you're trying to create one group to start. So you're trying to find okay, four things so like, that you think are connected. Monkey bars and is tetherball a thing you find on playgrounds? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna do that and I click submit. <laughs> ah. Oh, okay. Was I, 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 I want to screenshot it for the people just to see where they would go with this. Uh, actually, there's no way for me to like figure out what the actual answer is right now, besides me actually doing it myself. But like, okay, I guess I guess I owe them one guess myself as well. Oh, for sure, monkey bars, tether ball, teeter totter, swings. Let's is there teeter totter on there? Yeah. Okay. Oh, and but it says one away. So one of these is. Oh, slide. Monkey. That should have been teeter totter. In this Which slide, one of yeah. these should I remove? Well, well, I'm gonna remove monkey bars because that's more of a gymnastics thing and not a playground thing. Well, tether ball, I think, is not. For sure, there's tether ball on. On playground. On a playground. I didn't go to school. I know. I can I tell know because fucking everybody else out there right <laughs> now. Oh my god, that's not it either. Wait, let me see. Are you just like that's what I just before. guessed? Okay, I think it's got. I think it's gonna be. And then where's the? There we go. 
Oh, wait. So I, there's only four. Oh, you did it. Yeah. See, I, I think it's not tetherball. swings, slide, monkey Tetherball is a game as opposed to like a static thing. But, it, okay. Like the tetherball pole would be the example, but that would have been cumbersome for them to list it that way. That's fun though, right? I, I do okay. that most okay, days. Cool. I do the, uh, the. They got me, dude, because like I just got into playing Wordle every day. Yeah. I currently have like a 98 day Wordle streak, and my my best Wordle streak prior was 110 days, and I don't even know how I fucked it up. Do you know what Wordle you did, is? You got Wordle for 110 days in a row. Yeah. That's really impressive. I was playing in the World Series of Poker, and this dude told me that he had like a 400 day streak, and I was just like, oh. You can, you, you I, did? I didn't. I didn't know you could have a streak. So I was like, "Oh my god!" Now I got <laughs> that. That sounds like my kind of thing. I was just distracted by you playing poker. Yeah, it's just like I feel like because all right, I'm getting old. Mm -hmm. So like the BMX bike thing, that's kind of in the past. It's like I'm not really spending time doing that. It just doesn't really appeal to me the way I used to. But people are always trying to get me to play golf or whatever, and I'm that's like, like basically I, giving up. I, I just I don't want to play golf because you know what I'm never going to be great at golf. Mm. I'm probably not even going to be sub, like sufficient at golf in my opinion. I just don't see it being the kind of thing that I would be good at. But with poker, I can see myself as the years go by getting better and better, and I feel like I could get to the point where like, I feel like I to a certain extent I'm already like I have the respect of a lot of like pro players and stuff who who look at me as somebody who's like put in a sufficient amount of work, and I'm like. I've gotten solid. I don't want to like hype myself up too much, but I feel like I'm I'm decent and they see me that way and I feel like I've worked really hard to get to that point. And poker is the kind of thing where it's like you cannot be a pro and compete against the pros. And in fact, the pros want to compete against you cuz long term they're going to take all your money. Mm -hmm. But um I think that's poker just does it for me. But here's a problem. I saw a list the other day of like most attractive to least attra attractive uh, yeah. hobbies. Yeah, I, th I think it was a men. fake list, but probably. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to replicate this in a survey. So some of the things on it looked stupid and out of place to me. So I'm, I'm in favor of that being a fake list. But it did say that video games was at the very top of the list, and that's very easy for me to imagine. As in being unattractive. Yeah, yeah. and and online that poker is basically like a video game. I don't You're think sitting you in make front money of your poker. I don't, I, I don't Which know. is better than, but people make money playing other games too, to a certain extent, especially by streaming and shit like that. But like my my wife, I think would be much more attracted to me if, if I went and rode bikes for the day or went hiking with the guys. I don't even know any guys who go hiking or did any kind of like outdoor activity. Whereas like me spending 12 hours playing poker tournaments on a Sunday, I don't, I don't think that's like this is, impressive. This is so funny because like in my culture, my sphere of friends, I would say that poker is like the bad boy version of everything. For sure. Like yeah. that, that's like sort of like the edgy, you know, People like doing cool, crazy shit. I think she knows enough about the culture of poker that she knows that it's not really like that, and it's actually very like technical and mathematical. Yeah, I mean, it is, that's why it's. The, I mean, the dudes who excel at poker are zero percent bad boy. They're all f just nerds who are really, really good at this complicated <laughs> sure, strategy but, game. But you have to compare it to my cult. Like my culture, like a lot of the people I know, are, like machine learning engineers and programmers. Right. Uh, but I think those actually are the kind of people who who excel, yeah. who do well at poker because it is like, yeah, there are like gambler type dudes, and you'll have like rich businessmen who like get into poker and they love donking off a couple hundred grand in a night or whatever. But like most of the dudes who are like really great at poker are like full on like body biohacker type yeah, yeah. nerds who are trying to optimize every single part of their life. And like the thing that separates like a decent play poker player from a great poker player in this day and age is largely like the amount of time that you spent staring at charts right. that break down the optimal play right. in extremely but, complicated situations. But let me argue this. So if you're a, like a super nerd who's like very smart uh, and you have like enough money to start in time to start playing poker, you're probably that demographic is the kind that like goes to fancy colleges and gets respective job, respectable jobs and like works as a high paid engineer at Google. Mm. And like usually you have like maybe parents that are overbearing and expect you to do something like sensible with your life. And yeah. so like, okay, poker is rebellious. So in like that compared sense, to this, yeah. poker is yeah, like right. gambling. This is like 
fuck you, mom and dad. I'm going to go use my nerdy smarts that you expect me to do something normal with. And then like go to this insane thing where I'm like maybe wasting my money. But that's the weird thing is that like that fantasy was so intact 20 years ago when online poker was still legal in America. And people were like newly learning about like the World Series of Poker and all these cool things. And there was all these like heroes that were created by like ESPN. And then... 2009, I believe they outlawed in America. So now, if you want to play poker in America, you have to either VPN onto a Euro site or you have to uh, like play on an unregulated site, which is what I do. And uh, that, and, and then also just the introduction of these solvers and like that basically can break down the exact technical correct play. That kind of took it away from this like idea that you could just be this like bad boy and make a living doing this. To the point where now it's like very well understood that you basically have to be a f- yeah. giant nerd. Basically solved, yeah. Yeah, that kind of changed the whole game. Once it became like, oh, look at his play style. Look at how he's doing things. He's creative. He's different. He's aggressive. To like, no, there is one correct way to do this. Mm-hmm. That that changed things a lot. That's what I'm doing after this. I'm going to play on this uh, live stream at the Hustler Casino. Oh, cool. They stuck me with a bunch of dudes who are. Very, very good. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm the spot. I'm, yeah. I'm the one who's going to be taken advantage of, but whatever. Do you have, like, a list of things about me that you were planning to ask? I did have a few other things, yeah. Um, I was just curious if, it, if you have it, like, structured out beforehand or if you just sort of remember it. And like with you, as there. soon as I started watching your shit, I was like, we can just have a good off the cuff conversation okay. talking about whatever. So I only wrote down a few things. But some people you watch and you're like, we can't have an off the conversation cuff. I have to plan. Yeah, there's people who I actually like really respect as podcasters. But when I watch them, I'm like, holy shit, like you are writing like really complicated questions in advance Mm -hmm. and you seem deeply uncomfortable when it goes off script which to me okay so you're like this for everybody that you interview mm, i mean sometimes i'll be a little bit more structured but for the most part i'm trying to meander okay so i'll have like a like a an outline but then i'm trying to just like deviate from that is this because your viewers prefer the meandering or because you prefer the meandering I feel like that's just going to get us to like more interesting terrain if we're willing to just like go down rabbit holes. Yeah, I think I'm often confused about rules for conversation, like unspoken social norms that people sort of haven't made explicit. Mm. And like one of these rules is like, how much do I interrupt and then ramble about something? Mm. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying that. Well, I think about that a lot, too, because like as a interviewer, you kind of always have the option to personalize the conversation and like just take it in the direction of talking about your experience. And I feel like that's a lot of times kind of like a selfish and non ideal decision to just like you tell me some shit about you and I'm just like, okay, let me tell you that exact same thing from me. Because in large part, my audience already knows all this shit about me. They have way Mm -hmm. too much knowledge about me. So it's kind of like. If I'm going to tell an anecdote about myself, I feel like I have to have a pretty high bar for it. Okay. I've told many of my best anecdotes and stories. and. Okay. So you're like cleared out. You've, you've dumped everything. I just don't. Honestly, like, I listen to Joe Rogan, and there are certain stories that he will tell, and I'll just be like, bro, <laughs> I, like, literally, yeah. this is probably my 15th time hearing you tell this fucking story. And I appreciate how much... You're acting like you're just not even on camera. You're just like having a good conversation. But like, seriously, bro, like, yeah. I've been listening to you for 10 years. Like, I, I, I don't want to hear this story again. But that's probably also a product of being like 54. You just, oh, yeah. You're just telling those stories over and over. But that, yeah. that, that to me is a big deal, though. Like, when do you become an old head? When do you become an old head? When do you start feeling like a geezer to your audience? Uh, Are you a geezer? Probably to a lot of these fucking 19-year-old kids who think like, oh, like that's the big hip-hop platform. Why the fuck is a 40-year-old white dude running it? And I I feel you. Like for sure, like I need to be unseated at some point. But that's a weird thing about being an interviewer or a podcaster is that I feel like you almost nobody's good at it until you're like into your 30s. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just hard to be like a t- a twenty one year old great conversationalist. Like, yeah, it's just unlike 
unlikely. Yeah. You know, just, you need a lot of life experience to be able to really interrogate somebody properly. So, okay, like, how did you turn to the escorting shit? I feel like I still am not clear on that. You went well, I from... Did, I did cam... I was a cam girl. Right, right. Worked at the factory that sucks. One thing led to another. Poor on a friend's couch. Desperately tried camming. I was like, oh my god, I made $60 today. <laughs> $60! It's the most I've ever seen in a day. <laughs> or, you know, for that amount of work. And then I camped for five or six years. Got real burnt out after a while. Mm -hmm. Had a brief stint at a not so great crypto company in 2017 and then turned to escorting because I was like, I need more money and I don't want to cam anymore. So then I started dudes. <laughs> it's funny though in the porn world how there's this weird uh, floating stigma associated with escorting because so many of the big girls do it. But the girls who don't do it kind of talk about the girls who do do it. Yeah, it's a fascinating like a little hierarchy. Bit of... As cam girls, also, we, like, we would have sex on camera, but I remember there was also stigma among the cam girls. Like, well, well she's like f going off and like f***ing her clients. Well, I money. feel like, okay, escorting is like Coke. When you do Coke, people start offering you Coke. People <laughs> can tell that you do Coke and they'll start kind of offering it to you like i get offered coke very little because people just know i don't do it anymore but like i think escorting is like that too where like people will talk to us sometimes about other girls and kind of act judgmental towards them for escorting or like ooh, you know she's she's been in new york for the last three weeks they don't shoot porn there you know she's escorting and it's like uh obviously like within the world of girls who actively escort that same person probably wouldn't talk to one of them about that like that, you know? Yeah. I, I feel like it's 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 only got that stigma because it's kind of looked at as some, like, brokey shit. Brokey shit? Yeah, like if you're making a shitload of money on OnlyFans or a shitload oh, of money yeah, doing yeah. studio porn, then you maybe yeah. wouldn't feel the need to do that. But, like, obviously some girls just like it, and some girls make a shitload of money doing it. Yeah, I mostly stopped doing escorting with OnlyFans took off for me. Mm. Uh, but I'm in the, currently the highest priced publicly listed escort in the world, as far as I can tell. So I'll do How much? Like 4K an hour. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's, uh, Not I. <laughs> yeah, so I don't do it super often, but like I still occasionally like it. Because again, if I want casual sex, this is a way of tricking my lady brain into letting me have casual sex. It's like not often, like sometimes it's nice, but sometimes it's not very high quality, but. I can't imagine like, because that, that as much as I've done well for myself over the years, if I could go some chick for like 45 minutes and like get four grand i mean shit that's tempting yeah but i don't think my wife would understand <laughs> she would she would judge me for that which is which is gay and she should open her mind that would oh, be maybe so, she should start escorting i think she should be like hmm. no i think that she should think it's hot that i my new escort career that i've just now decided <laughs> that i'm going to take on she should think it's hot no you know what i thought was hot there's a fucking male porn star I know, and I'm gonna just shout him out. Shout out Kieran Lee, and I seen him at an event, and he's with his wife, and she doesn't do porn. She takes care of the family, and he goes out and he lays dick down mm -hmm. and pays those fucking bills, fucking I'll these leave. hoes. Yeah. Even though that is not my situation, when I realized that was his situation, I was just like, oh. Fuck yeah that's badass dude that's just there's something cool as fuck about that to me that he's just like a cowboy going off into the world and just laying shit down and then just come back and be a family man yeah i mean work is work it's interesting to me how psychologically different clients are from normal sex like mm. some people yell at me when I, I, like, like people have very strong opinions about body count and mm. like i don't want to artificially deflate my body count but it kind of feels to me psychologically that my body count is only unpaid sex like oh yeah sex with clients feels like it's work i don't know it just doesn't hit the same part of my brain at all right and it's weird because it's like on a surface level if I'm talking about a, f a female porn star with a, a random dude, like a non-performer, a civilian, mm -hmm. it's easy for me to be like, oh, Haley Davies? Yeah, I liked her. I liked her a bunch of times. But in my, deep down inside, yeah, you, you f***ed her for OnlyFans. You f***ed her for content. Yeah. That is like, it's not like you really like just met her and she chose to let you f*** her. That's, that's, that's different. Yeah. 
But to the civilian, it's just as cool that I did it on yeah. camera. <laughs> Even though to me, I feel a little shady being like, yeah, f her. <laughs> I know, right? Because like sometimes I'll be like, well, the you know my sex count feels like it's you know the smaller number, and then people online will get so mad at me. They're like, what do you mean your clients don't count? Like, you know, this girl's trying to downplay her her body count or whatever. Mm. Um, but I get it. And I'm like, sure, but I don't know. I, it feels like f weirdly false. But. but also, like, my body count before porn, was, uh, I feel like maybe I'm at, like, 700 now, but I think I was at 300 before I started mm -hmm. doing porn. And it's like, when I think about the girls I was fucking, I mean, like, they're not even... The average girl that I before porn is just, like, so much less attractive than the girls that I in porn. Or if I was single now, the kind of chicks that I could realistically get mm -hmm. just off of clout, charisma, whatever. Like, I was just, like, I was random ass bar trolls <laughs> for the whole beginning part of my life random chicks mm -hmm. off my space not nothing to really be proud of <laughs> when I, like and that's like just such a bullshit way to inflate your number like you know <laughs> the random chick off my space is like gonna watch this and be like no for sure i never hear from any of them which is weird hmm, like, do you think the, they I, watch you uh i don't know like randomly some girl that i when i was like 21 called me the other day and was like i'm i'm hanging out with this dude getting drunk and he's like telling me he's a big fan of you holy shit this is weird like i fucked you back in the day and i was like wow this is such a weird conversation i never get to have i was just like <laughs> how'd it feel did you feel good yeah whatever just do fucking... you think you would know if you f if it felt good like do you have that level of self-insight um i just feel like now like very like almost no chick is going to be able to have an effect of like making me feel good or feel like I'm like boosting my ego off a girl. Yeah. It's just not really like, which is like, I feel like that's the thing I was addicted to. There's a subreddit called r slash big problems. Uh -huh. Are you familiar with this? No. There's but. like a vibe where it's like people are kind of sad on the subreddit, but like everybody from the outside is like, you have nothing to be sad about. And yeah. I'm like wondering if this is the way people feel about you where you're like, damn, no women can make me feel uh, I've had sex with so many of them. It barely counts. Like, do people are like, "Oh no, this is his big dick problem." For sure, there's girls that could make me feel something. It's just that they're probably not going to be like a regular chick. Yeah, because yeah, standards I, are high. I, 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 this is a weird thing that happens, and I'm going to sound like a total asshole. Is that once you have like a sufficient amount of clout, and once you have a sufficient number of fans, and once you've had a sufficient yeah. number of people treat you like you're something so special, anyone who gets slotted into the fan category is immediately like, you're not gonna be able to make me feel anything. Yeah. Because you just asked me for a picture and I f with that, like, that's dope. I appreciate the fandom, but I can't take you serious as like a participant in my emotional state. Right. You know? Oh yeah, people hate me when I talk about this online. They hate it because like as I've like grown in influence and power or right. something it feels like the kinds of people I'm attracted to have like increased also or, or like now the pool is like getting smaller right. of people that feel like they matched me or something uh, I, I don't think I could be in a relationship with somebody that, that didn't yeah. have like a public persona yeah it's I don't think that weird. they'd be able to get it or like understand right and I'm I think at. I thought that this was like a shallow concept before it happened to me but like when I'm around or like in relationships with people who are significantly less powerful than me like it manifests in the relationship right. it like starts to come out in weird ways and i'm like i don't like feeling like i have this much power over another person like i mm. want to be in a relationship with an equal but it's rough that's the weird thing in hip-hop is that dudes will end up in relationships with girls right and then they'll like it'll come out that that girl f***ed so and so another famous dude prior and it is like a scandal because she had sex before the relationship yeah basically like the, the notion that she had casual sex with one of your peers and that you now are in a real relationship with her and you chose to like invest in this person and love this person and spend money on this person etc that's looked upon as if like you're kind of a clown even though I can throw out like infinite examples of like, okay, so Travis Scott is like one of the absolute biggest rappers and he's in an on and off relationship with Kylie Jenner, who's like basically the most famous person in our culture. Right. And you know, you could look at a whole list of dudes that she 
fucked around with before him, right? And he still chose to get in a relationship with her, even though, like, you know, he's basically got his pick of, like, nearly any woman that he could want, you'd mm -hmm. think. And so, but, but still, like, okay, Ruby Rose is another chick. Super fucking hot, super famous within hip-hop and shit like that. She gets into a relationship, which I guess we don't necessarily know that this was real, but it was at least being presented somewhat convincingly that it was real with this guy Drewski. He's a comedian. People immediately start trying to, like, trigger him by posting screenshots of, like, collages that they created of, like, 50-plus dudes that they claimed that she slept with. Now, a lot of these names were, like, very debatable. Like, we have no real reason to think that she actually slept with these people. But, like, the, like, the fact that she's physically fucking gorgeous, rich as fuck, famous as fuck, is, like totally diminished and like treated as if it's nothing in comparison to the fact that like oh she may or may not have slept with like 50 dudes is it the fact that they're sleeping with dudes at all or like rather dudes who are n known to the person like peers i don't think it would be as of interest if people weren't able to identify at least some of these dudes but for sure just the body count okay, in general okay. is enough to oh, like, this is like a typical her. body count like why would you yeah you know? yeah but famous yeah. body count is worse because just the idea of like that, that dude has that over you. If you get into an argument with that dude, that dude can always say, yeah, it your bitch. Over you. <laughs> and so in my culture, like all my friends fuck each other. We have all like watched right. each other fuck each and other. That's the fucked up thing is I'm in hip hop and I'm in porn. Yeah. Okay. And in porn, so it's got weird. In porn, it is still kind of like that. What do they think of you? In hip hop? Yeah. Or do they like. Zestophile. They think I'm just weird as fuck. They're just like. Okay, but you're accepted. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the fringes. Okay. Like, I'm not, are, like, have polarized opinions about you. Very, yes. I see. Yeah. But, uh, you know, honestly, like, me letting another guy fuck my wife in hip-hop is, like, totally new, uncharted mm -hmm. ground. Nobody has ever done anything like this. Mm -hmm. Considering that, I think the fact that I, like, interview all these rappers, like, every week and that most of them don't even bring it up anymore is, like, kind of... That's cool. For sure, I, like, opened up the window of, like, what's considered acceptable in hip-hop. It's uh, not like there's anyone following behind me or anything, but, like, the fact, like, the next dude who does do something like what I did with that whole thing will not take nearly as much flack. However, oh, great. the question is, will anyone ever take on such a bizarre No, I think there's, like, a, such quest. an important part in culture is to be, like, the f one willing to do the weird shit and then get a whole bunch of flack for it. No, Like, I yeah. wish more people were in this category. I feel like I'm often doing this. I'm, like, pushing a whole bunch of boundaries all the time and being really public about it. And I'm, like, widely hated for these things. Mm. But I'm, like, somebody has to do it, right? You have a whole bunch of other people who maybe privately would like to live like this on their own. And they have, like, nobody else who, like, happens to be in a better position who can, like, be able to handle it. It's like you're doing it for like a bunch of people who quietly feel the same thing, but don't feel brave enough to say it. I think it's really lovely and very virtuous. But it's weird because you still have to make your decisions based on not just what you think is right or what the vision of what is right is going to be 10 years down the road. You have to also think about the cultural moral mores in which you like exist. And so like the example that I'm, that comes to mind is like, a lot of times I'll see old documentaries and they'll be like talking to some band or some like artist and there'll be like an opportunity for them to take some kind of corporate sponsorship and they'll reject it because up until the last maybe like 10 years, if you were an artist and you took on a corporate sponsorship, it was like largely looked down upon as if you were a sellout. But if you like were to be alive in 1995 right now and you were Kurt Cobain, would you take the Sprite sponsorship? Because the truth is, is that that probably would have defined Kurt Cobain's legacy, even though the modern Kurt Cobain probably would take the Sprite sponsorship and nobody would really like look down upon them for it, right? Okay. So the question is, is like, do you want to be right long term or do you want to be beloved within your era? Because the reality is that most people are not going to be forward thinking enough to realize that things are changing. I, well, I don't know. It feels like there's something beyond that, which is like I have like certain values, which are like be as honest as you can to yourself and other people. And like maybe this is going to make you popular now or long term or neither. But there's something that feels like wholesome and important to me about that. Like mm -hmm. and also deeply loving, like so much of people's attention is taken up with like checking your social shame things like am I socially acceptable and I think this happens on a subconscious level a lot of the time um, but like I've had my life changed quite a lot by seeing people other people accepting parts of themselves that I couldn't yet accept in myself right, I saw you pointing out that like there's no uh, polyamory ever presented in movies mm -hmm. 
which is kind of interesting. Yeah, basically none. There's Bajiro Mastani, kind of, and Professor Wharton, Wharton and the Wonder Woman. How do you say that? I feel like people would almost have a hard time becoming invested in it because it's so foreign to so many people, right? Right. I mean, the same true is about gay people for a while and also trans people. Yeah, but I feel like a lot of heterosexual people, like when they watch movies, it's tough to have even a trans character or a, f a gay narrative. It's like it's it's kind of jarring. Yeah, I agree it, that it it's hard to see that without feeling like, the... oh, OK, here we go. They're cramming this down my throat just because that's like the conservative reaction to it. And Yeah, sure. But like uh, a lot of stuff that I like when I'm asking the qu question, how culturally accepted is something I like using the ad test? Like, could a corporation successfully use this thing in an ad to sell a product? Mm. Um, and then so, like it depends a little bit on the culture you're selling to. Like obviously things that are selling to conservatives will use different things than liberals. But for example, like we have gay people in ads now. This is just like a thing. And so I think it's like a good example that this is culturally accepted. Mm. Trans people like a little bit less so. Um, like we see them in some kinds of media. Uh, and like, but they're very polarized right now. But I felt like people, I, I, not basically, not at all. I felt like Euphoria was the first yeah. TV show that I saw, or like piece of art that I saw that made me feel more understanding of the trans experience and made me like really kind of question my own assumptions. Oh, cool. How did it make you question your own assumptions? <sighs> You know what else had this effect on me is uh, there's this, this punk band against me and the singer transitioned Tom to Laura Grace, I believe. And I read her biography and that really also like really hmm. forced me to like emphasize, empathize with trans people more than I probably had oh, up till that great. point. Yeah. Which I always felt like I was kind of open minded to it, but like really just seeing the turmoil that somebody must go through to make that decision. Yeah, it just really like knocked me over the head. But I don't know. I mean, like feels like the average conservative person like walls themselves off to not be able to have that reaction. Even though yeah. JD Vance was apparently uh, a, a very strong connection to a trans person at some point in his life. So like that's a that's a good model for them of like, oh, this would this is what it would be like to treat a trans person like a human being, even though he right. I, I guess did a hard pivot away from it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the whole thing is complicated. Like the culture war, I think, especially like makes it more difficult because now people have like identity yeah. anchored in not accepting trans people. And like it's going to be embarrassing for them to change their mind. Yeah. This is one problem. I think we have a lot of culture is like if you want to actually change people's mind, you have to like give them forgiveness and approval once they do. Mm. But a lot of people, it's like, oh, you're like, you're so stupid for believing this. You're a bigot. And now now people like anchor down harder they're like no i'm not like i have reason for thinking what i do uh instead you have to be like hey i, I understand you believe this but like it's totally chill if you like come over here you know it's, it's like, good and wholesome to like change your mind about these things we need that we need like transphobes for kamala <laughs> yeah. and we need to just be like yes come in like <laughs> it's all good like we're not with you on that but you know, we'll probably figure something out long term, you know, like we like because the, the, the Republicans are just so good at just inviting everybody in uh, the, to the point where it's, a, it's shocking when they start shunning the like hot Republican chicks who are like posting bikini pictures and shit. Because it's like you guys are supposed to just be like taking you, you don't even give the Nazis a hard time. Like the, the real deal white supremacists, you guys are like quietly like, yeah, OK, you're good. Like you're on our side. But then somehow it's like when a conservative woman is like, well, actually, I'm kind of like in favor of abortion being legal. It's like, ah, oh, get the fuck out of here. You're done. We, yeah. we can't have you over here. They, do, they are kind of weirdly insane about women. Yeah. But I mean, I was raised in that culture. I don't know. Like, I came from like a pretty strong being insane about women culture. So I yeah. guess that makes sense. We were also very anti-abortion, like protested abortion clinics. And right. and I grew up in a mega liberal family. That seems slightly chiller. No, yeah, it was chill. My parents like had gay friends when I was a kid. Oh, nice. Jew friends. Wow. We would be like, they would hide gold coins around the house, and we go find the the chocolate gold coins. That was like a Jewish like tradition that we did. <laughs> and when I think about it now, I'm like, hmm. <laughs> okay, sure, whatever. Yeah. My parents had a bunch of Republican friends too. Like, I remember oh. going over their houses and just hearing my parents argue like Clinton versus Bush. And but it seemed like it was in good spirit. Yeah, I do wish we had more of that nowadays. There's the thing where it's like if somebody disagrees with you, you sort of assume they're stupid instead of being curious about why they disagree. Right. I think curiosity could get us a lot farther. 
but there's just a lot of Republican positions that I just don't even want to talk to you about because they're just so stupid that it's like I just don't even want to have this conversation because it's just going to make me think less of you. And well. so I feel towards a lot of my peers. Yeah. Do you tell them that? I just kind of ignore it. I remember I went to Miami and like was meeting up with like, you know, the Fresh and Fit podcast is. I've heard legends. Right. There are legends. But like I, I went to like a restaurant to meet up with them and uh, everyone at the table is just like basically talking about how the, the vaccine is going to kill you. And I'm like, I'm fucking vaccinated. That shit is bullshit. Like, what the fuck are you talking about, bro? Well, why do you think they everyone think at the table just like looking at me like, whoa, like they were shocked <laughs> that I was like pro vaccine. So they must be in such a strong cultural bubble to like be surprised when somebody has a deviant opinion. For sure. So, so why do you think they believe that? Like, why do you think that this cultural bubble has gotten created at all? I just think the conspiracy shit is so alluring to people. Why is it alluring? It's just there's a lot of power to be had in being the, the person who is presenting this information to your audience. Mm. Do you feel that similar level of power in anything else? Uh, <laughs> not really. I don't feel like I'm trying to like push any like dissident and cultural Wait, opinions what's, what's on the, people. What's the craziest conspiracy theory you believe? God, that's a tough one. I don't know if I believe any of them. Like, well, I mean, there's okay. there's there's conspiracies. Do you live in aliens? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm so resistant to conspiracies that by the time I would believe in one, it would be like accepted common knowledge. Okay. Okay. So you're very like low risk in terms of the kinds of yes f theories about the world that you ascribe to. Yeah, pretty much. Like, I really, I really need you to prove this to me if I'm going to believe that, you know, Trump set yeah. himself up to be shot so he could garner support to win the election, which is like a real position that like people were like, really, oh, you see Trump got shot? That shit seemed like a setup. <laughs> like, people I know, like, pushing this. And I'm just like, bro. Yeah, you're like, like you're gambling, right? You might make a lot of money off prediction markets. I heard Destiny saying on his podcast with Sam Harris today that one of his favorite things to do is to buy stock in companies that like lose a shitload of value after being canceled, like Bud Light, because he's so confident that within like a couple months that it bumps back. it's going to jack back up. That makes a lot of sense to me. Right, but you can also make predictions about normal. So prediction markets are where you can like make a statement about the world, like will I break up with my girlfriend in three months, and mm -hmm. people bet on it. And then a lot of people will bet on things like, will it turn out that like the Trump thing was a fake? And you can bet on it. So you can bet. Poker against players do these this people. all the time. Like, well, not that specifically, but there's like a lot of this weird prediction market shit. And I've never really got into it, but yeah. It's pretty fun. Mm. You can make predictions about like what the guests will say on your podcast um, or like if your audience will like them or something. It seems like such a bizarre thing to do because like it's so obviously cheat. Yeah, well, that's cheating but is encouraged. tell encourage. you like, hey, Say this at some point during the podcast. Well, I'm, I'm going to make ten thousand dollars on this betting website. Right, right. you'd think that, uh, but every time I've tried to manipulate one of my own markets, I actually lose because like people like rapidly learn what you're doing. They're like, oh, he told the person to say this last time, or the person like unusually said this last time. Now we're going to bump up the theory that maybe he told them to say it. And the next time you do this prediction market, people are going to adjust. It feels easy to manipulate. Yeah, you want, well, then so you can make money. Well, I mean, I, I I hear a lot of people say that like. If you're not willing to bet on your opinion, yeah. then you don't really even hold Make that Make your beliefs opinion. pay rent, yeah. Yeah. Whack, but I did this podcast with this guy, Whack 100, this bald-headed and he's always trying to do that. He's like, put money on it, put money on it. I think that's virtuous. I think it's really good. Not the way he does it. The way he's oh. doing it is like manipulative <laughs> and evil, but for other people, well, I agree. But the yeah. thing is, even, I think if he's trying to do it in a manipulative and evil way, like ultimately the money will tell the truth, right? Mm. So like, if he's like trying to manipulate you to do something, but you're correct, then he's going to look like an idiot. I don't feel like when it comes time to settle up that I would be able to get an, a rational okay. assessment of whether that thing okay, happened that's fair. or not. If the market maker is biased, then you do have problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I don't want him to be the judge of that. Um, okay, I have to pee. We just did like two hours. Jesus Christ.
my fucking burps are coming out. That's that a nice way to end this. Um, do you want to promote anything? You want to tell them what your OF is or anything like that? Uh, well, mostly I'm writing a good at sex series. So okay. uh, I track a lot of data. All the clients that I have, I wrote down like sex positions, orgasm rates. I, I've basically been keeping a shit ton of data about sex and interviews with people about sex for years now. Mm -hmm. And like based on all this, I'm writing a series. Like the girl in Mall Rats. What? I don't you have no idea. Watch the movie Mallrats and you're going to immediately know when there's a character who's basically okay. you. Okay, so I am apparently that's this girl in Mallrats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've collected a whole bunch of data and I've like um now I'm writing a series of like how to be good at sex, like basically like the the advanced mode of sex. Mm. Um how to like basically get a girl hooked on your penis heroin in a metaphorical sense. Um and so far uh, it's gotten great reviews and seems about a third of people who read it report noticeably increased reviews from their sex partners. Um, so that's that's my passion right now, and if you want to like get anything out of all the effort I've been putting in, like that's what I would recommend. Nice. Yeah. How do I pronounce your name again? Ayla. Ayla. Yeah. Okay. I didn't even say it the whole yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, good job. I know. Yeah. I, don't, I wasn't trying to. I didn't notice until just then when I said <laughs> it great. too. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Appreciate you. It was a good conversation. Yeah. Thank you too. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Like, comment, subscribe. We out.